Good morning, everybody. Uh, slowly the room is filling. Uh, it's always the problem when you do a 10 a.m. type panel on the second day of Marco's conference. Um, it's between you and uh, the 5 a.m. finish time. So we are very glad you could make it. I welcome a distinguished panel uh, of four uh, TV executives and digital uh, entrepreneurs. And before we launch in the discussion of the future of television, can I invite everybody to briefly introduce uh, himself and uh, say what they're doing, and uh, then we launch in the questions. Guillaume, do you want to start? Sure, thanks, Philippe. My name is Guillaume de Poche. I'm co-CEO of the RTL Group. I'm Andy Chen. I'm Andy Chen. Uh, I'm the CEO. I'm not the founder, actually. Small correction. Uh, I am the CEO of uh, Preview Networks. Uh, we're a video syndication and audience engine in Europe. I'm Thomas Ebeling. I'm the CEO of Pro7 Sat1, a German-based uh, broadcaster. For those of you who've just joined, Kai, he Kai Henniges, CEO and co-founder of Uster Video on Demand Speaking platform. That's okay. Could you hear Thomas and uh, you know the, Could you hear them in the back? I thought it was pretty silent, but just say something if you can't hear. So we had Jörg Mohopt uh, and others uh, last uh, yesterday morning talk about the future of music, and I want to start with drawing out the contrast. As you all know, when technology disrupted the music industry with Napster, ten years later, 50 percent of the revenue pool of that industry have been destroyed. And that was really because people felt the music industry was overbundled, overpriced, and uh, too inflexible. Now, to contrast that, some of you may know that we had a campaign a couple weeks ago in the US where within 48 hours, more than 200,000 people logged onto a website called Take My Money HBO and begged HBO to take $12 a month so they would have access to HBO content with a streaming app. So let me just start with the panel and ask, why is there such a difference between music, where nobody seems to be wanting to pay, and television and video content, where people are still begging to pay? Here. Yeah, shall I start? Well, the good news about TV is that music needs TV, TV doesn't need music. Let me give you a very simple example. Look at American Idol. All the stars in music are now, by and large, created by TV shows. Of course, you've got some internet kind of a shootouts, but TV still makes and develop musicians and music. And there are probably three reasons why uh, the TV business is completely different from the doldrums of music. The first one is that TV is free. As far as Thomas and I are concerned, we operate free-to-air channels, meaning free for the viewers. And I was used to say, nothing beats free. Here it is. Music was a pay model. Second, music was a retail business, a physical retail business. Thanks God, we are not in the retail business. We are basically in the broadcast business. And the third major difference is, of course, the fact that music was all about CDs, about physical goods. Thanks God, TV is digital. As we speak, 100% of our business is fully digitalized, uh, which is, I believe, the third major difference between the music industry and the TV industry. Okay, thank you, Guillaume. Maybe we launch into the fact that you know, TV uh, viewing is still going up, but if you look at the demographics of it, there's clearly a difference between the 12 to 29-year-old age group where people start watching TV in a more non-linear fashion, where people actually asking for content when they want to see it, where they want to see it, in a much more flexible way than older age groups. Um, Kai, do you want to talk a little bit about how the viewing patterns are changing from your perspective? So, gladly, yes. Um, we are seeing our average audience is two-thirds young males, so 18 to 35 age bracket, and obviously we cater to them with, uh, with our content offering. We try and lean more towards action, um, more slightly more towards content that's geared for that audience. We see that, as Guillaume says, nothing beats free. Uh, we get, <coughs> I would say at the moment, it's 99% of the users who watch free. And with us, they can pick the content they want and watch it when they like it. Obviously, we need to build out 
the content offering further still as, as we go along. <coughs> and then we've got this upsell into paid transactions for the very most recent contents um, because otherwise those wouldn't be available on, on our platform. So maybe on that point, uh, Thomas, if you look at the fact that Posibin is the most appealing channel for young audiences and you see the development um, to more flexible viewing patterns, to uh, catch-up TV, etc., how do you protect um, the fact that Posibin is really the place to go for this type of content for these audiences in the, in the face of other business models? Yeah, first of all, I would say there are still a lot of people who enjoy um, a fire camp experience together with the family by viewing the same content at the same time together. The young audiences are a bit different and um, they are more likely to enjoy nonlinear viewing. Uh, in our program development, we uh, always factor in uh, to develop tools that allow complementary viewing online. So we have a tool called uh, ProSieben Connect where the viewer, while watching the TV show, can have new experiences, can chat, can vote, can ask for more information. And uh, obviously we have to uh, offer catch-up opportunities and we have to <coughs> market and cooperate with social media. So to get the young audience, I think, complementary viewing, allowing catch-up on all uh, mobile or other devices, and to cooperate with social media is the way to go, but we should not forget that uh, most people still enjoy lean back consumption together with other people as a fire camp experience. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, Andy, you know, there's a lot of harmony so far on the panel. I try to move it on a little bit. I mean, clearly the question is, if we project out a few years, the business model that Guillaume described where you have mass audiences which create an ability to mass commercialize uh, through big advertisements and then use that money to acquire the most appealing content and that creates this virtuous cycle where you have a lot of money, you pay the, for the best content, the best content creates the best viewers and so on and so forth. <coughs> what could, in your you, you're coming up with an innovative commercialization model where you syndicate, syndicate out to very different places. What could disrupt this model? Um, could it be um, could it be content or could it be distribution or none of the above, all of the above? I think the big issue we have today with uh, it's clearly aud audience fragmentation. So too many devices, too many destinations and people can get content from a lot of places. So I think you know, our job is uh, you know, the way we see the, the, the content business is not so much that we're going to take over the, the large businesses. In fact, we're very much seen as an enabler. So we simply connect the content to the audience and distribute the content from one central location to thousands of other destinations and platforms. Um, I think what's maybe more interesting is to look at the, you know, what is the definition of broadcast, quote unquote, right? So I think broadcast in a very generic term is by definition distributing content to a mass uh, amount of people, hence broadcast. Uh, I think what's interesting is that when you, when you can actually aggregate the same amount of people, let's say volume-wise, um, from thousands or hundreds of thousands of destinations, you know, uh, using one system and one platform, does that count as broadcast or does broadcast have to be one single location? Right. So that's a philosophical uh, discussion, but I think it's, uh, it has business relevance to, to the world today. So if we move a bit to the technology side, Guillaume, if you look at what disrupted the, mu the music industry, it was really the big technology guys, right? Apple capturing the business model. If we look at Google, we look at Apple, we look at Microsoft, with the Xbox, uh, with YouTube, you know, with iTunes, they have great platforms with big reaches. Um, what is your perspective um, on, you know, the threat that that represents to the TV broadcasting industry today? Sure. Well, first of all, I've got you know, a very simple philosophy, which is to say that you're right, distribution and big distributors are king, but thanks God, content is still King Kong. And why is that so? Simply because obviously these people and viewers are using, are using all these mediums simply to have access to great shows. 
And thanks God, we not only broadcast and produce these great shows, but Fremantle, which belongs to our group, is also, as you know, the producers of these big entertainment shows, which, uh, which draws audience. That's point one. Point two, nevertheless, we need to be cognizant of the fact that these new players roll in. And the big difference that we experienced since a couple of years is that we traditionally used to think in what I would call Schengen frontiers business. Mm -hmm. You had Germany, you had France, you had England, and everybody was nicely competing in his own little ecosystem. Now, there are new kids in town which roll out, so to speak, on a worldwide basis, all these new products. You mentioned them. And therefore, we need to operate in this new segment as well. This is precisely why we develop our own VOD platforms. <coughs> this is why we want to own and operate our own YouTube channels. As you know, YouTube has been funding many new YouTube channels who are part of these. We created these, we operate these. And therefore, we need to hedge our bets, so to speak, in the long run, making sure that we not only reach our viewers through our traditional media business, but also with these new forms of television in the long run. Andy? I just want to add something because, uh, you know, I came from Viacom, and uh, I think Sumner Redstone uh, was uh, famous for coining the term content is king. And, uh, you know, at my current company, we talk about content is absolutely still the king. King Kong now. Uh, king Kong, yes. And, uh, but distribution is the queen because without the, the distribution, you can't make yeah. it happen. However, there's one extra element which is, you know, change. It is what digital has brought to the landscape is that search is God. And this is uh, actually, I, I didn't make this up as a quote. So I think, you know, in the digital world, discovery of the content, how, are, how do you discover the content? A lot has to do with uh, the meta tags and everything else, uh, all the information associated with, uh, with it. So I guess you can say the definition or the, the description has expanded a bit, which is content is absolutely king, distribution is the queen, but search is God. Thomas? Yeah, uh, it's worthwhile to mention that content is this very driving search. Because if you think about how many uh, internet activities are TV related and how much uh, TV content is driving search, it really shows that it, it, it all belongs together. And uh, you should not underestimate the promotional power uh, of TV stations. I mean, uh, for example, our group is reaching 20 million viewers every day. So if we would have a new show, we can certainly uh, promote this show much more aggressively and to some degree targeted as well to a certain demographics than, than any other, I would say, online channel. So um, I would still say that the content quality and reach of TV uh, has a very dynamic impact as well on, 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 on digital and search. Kai, any perspective? Yes, sure. Um, so I'd like to add to that mix the way the media agencies are starting to behave. And what we are seeing, we're coming from a world of video advertising. And initially, it was all bought, well, basically deliver as much as you can, and we'll put campaigns into that. And now, if you look at someone like Group M, they founded a daughter company, Xaxis. And all they do is they're after very specific audiences. So they say, deliver 10 million impressions to me, but maybe they only want half of those because they're dropping cookies, and they know exactly which users they want to reach. So I think that sort of leaves an interesting question in that you still need to deliver them a big audience, but they only want small segments of that big audience. And will basically the digital model that we're driving, will that be able to, on those smaller audiences, be able to afford the, the big content TV shows that are currently on, on free TV. And I would argue that you're going to see more and more fragmentation and that possibly, yes, TV viewing is still growing, but the younger generation, um, they need to be addressed with smaller content niches almost to make sure that you reach exactly the users that you want to reach. Because, I mean, nothing is as annoying as seeing a Procter & Gamble ad for some detergent uh, in your favorite show 
when you're really not that target audience, right? And, and digital can do away with that problem. Um, and, and it really does, but can it deliver audiences sure. of, of the right size? I think you're going to the core of actually what the business model of free-to-air broadcasting is, which is for brand building or other purposes, you need to reach mass audiences. And it, that's both the case absolutely and relatively. So if you have more fragmentation, the question to Guillaume and Thomas is, if you're relatively speaking still reaching 10x, 5x, 13x of the next biggest content group, do you see that as a sustainable business model that you will find somebody to either pay you cash for that, uh, for these eyeballs in terms of advertising, <coughs> or what Christian Wigner, Thomas, has described, maybe you do revenue share models, you do other models to actually monetize that, that these eyeballs, yeah? Is that a sustainable business model? Well, I'll have the first kick. It's all about facts and numbers. If yeah. you look at the daily consumption of TV per day, it's actually, to make it simple, across Western Europe at 240 minutes a day. If you just take the sum of all the streaming of video on internet, it's actually 10 minutes. So talking about the X, you've, you've got the ratio, which is now. Will that change in the future? Definitely. The good news is that, at least for the time being, the 10 minutes that I'm talking about in internet are actually additive to the 240. They are not deductive. In other words, it didn't go to 230 against 10. It's basically 250 minutes overall, so it's additive. Will it stay like this in the long run? I don't believe so. I think that at some point, you know, TV usage might diminish. This is the reason why we need to do our, what I call, auto-fragmentation. Actually, if you just take this here, within the footprint of the group, we're launching new channels. And by the way, these channels are linear channels. We're launching them in Germany, in France, in other, in other territories, simply because we believe that we need to be part of that fragmentation process so that the sum of all the channels that we operate still is the same as the channels with whom we started. So, so we do that. So you're introducing a core competence, which is actually a bundling of content packages for viewer groups relative to YouTube or, or Amazon, who are now trying to do the same trying to replicate exactly that core competence. Absol absolutely. So we defend these 240 minutes, and on top of it, we operate within the 10-minute segment. We create YouTube channels. You know, Fremantle, as we speak, has got four uh, channels. Do they move the needle as mm. far as the turnover of the group is concerned in the EBITDA? No, they don't. Will they do in five years? Possibly. And therefore, we're hedging our positions, and we operate there as well. Thomas, do you want to talk a bit about uh, that, but also how you have innovated actually commercializing these eyeballs with other means than advertising? Yeah, first of all, I think we have to remind ourselves that no other medium has such a well-established return on investments on advertising than TV. We just recently completed a study that um, almost 80% of brands who advertise on TV create over the period of three years a significant uh, return on investment and 30% already, you know, after year one. So I think that most uh, online media have not yet proven this and some of the statistics um, <coughs> communicated by some leading internet providers are mixing up net and cross and have some other methodology flaws. But overall, TV is well documented. No other medium has such an impact. Just imagine you are sitting with five of your friends in a living room and you're watching a great music show like The Voice and you see some advertising about a great new product and some of your friends are saying, oh, what a great product, I like it. You have immediate an impact because people see it's a big brand advertising on TV and your friends or your family is saying, oh, it's a great brand. And then in contrast, you're alone in your little office and you surf the internet and you see a little display advertising and you're just alone. So, I think TV is by far the most significant brand building medium in the world and I believe it will remain like this. Obviously we have to face as well fragmentation and what we do is we are launching new free to air channels for well targeted populations like you know young females or you know um, rich elderly people no? and in addition we have our own website called my video where we have more than 400 niche channels uh, we are as well experimenting with user generated content but my true belief is for big brands 
there is nothing like TV because in TV you know exactly the content in which you are advertising, you have a great image spillover, you have great reach, and you have great emotional impact. But I believe as well that dig digital can be a great complement to TV. And I think the uh, media combination of the future will definitely be TV and online, and that will outperform all other media. Maybe on business model, advertising dollars one side, you got eyeballs, commercialization of those eyeballs. Christian talked a bit about it. Do you want to talk about this, how, yeah. how else broadcasters can commercialize? Yeah, I think we, um, we offer special collaborations with digital companies um, that we offer more than just advertising uh, that include editorial integration, that includes collaboration with our other digital businesses like online games or collaboration with our video on demand platforms, our music label. Um, we try as well to um, get more money out of the cable companies. I think um, one big opportunity, if you compare the margins which are made uh, in the industry, uh, the cable companies make a lot of margins uh, without having the creative risk like we have. And uh, we really would appreciate if we could get a larger share of what they are making. Uh, and certainly the US cable model is not yet so popular and successful in Germany, and that would provide for us going forward a great opportunity. So advertising income, distribution income, and collaboration with digital companies, while at the same time <laughs> becoming a more digitalized broadcaster, this will become very essential for our company going forward. I want to talk a bit about technology, but before I do that, Thomas raised another interesting topic which brings us back to the beginning of our panel where we talked about Take My Money HBO. And Guillaume, you've been in pay TV uh, in your life as well, so you know that very well. Um, if you contrast free to air, we sp spoke a lot about this with pay TV, and which indeed is a bundled proposition. It's a proposition where people uh, pay a certain amount of money. Uh, that money tended to go up uh, regularly year by year by high single digit percentages. And it's quite inflexible uh, if you don't look at the pay-per-viewing propositions. So is the future of television safer in free-to-air broadcasting than it is in pay TV? How do you see the future for the HBOs, for the uh, Time Warner cables of the world relative to the broadcasters? Sure. Well, another way to say it is, and you, you know it, it's the cut cord. In other words, are, are the consumers, in particular, there was a big debate in the US, are they cutting their cable cord and getting to OTT with Netflix? Do they substitute HBO by Netflix? That was basically very much the thesis of, of a few analysts in the US. The reality is a little bit different for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's like when you go to a restaurant, you know, you, you have the choice between the menu and the individual plates. Still, 80% of the people choose the menu. Here, HBO is the menu, Netflix is the individual plates. The 80-20 rules applies very much. That's point one. Point two, there is a lot of consumer inertia. You are used to your HBO package. You are used to your cable operator. I'm not sure that overnight, because of a pure price comparison, you want to switch. So look, sure. out, look out five years, 10 years. In 10 years, obviously, people will start you know, doing arbitrage, yes. But I still believe that HBO has got a long-running model in front of them, simply because you know, they've created a brand. They've got their own shows. They've got the Sopranos. They've got the top, top shows and films that people have been watching. And they will continue to develop these films, mm -hmm. obviously, not only on cable, but also on these new platforms. So I'm sure that they will benefit in the long run of all these new platforms mm. emerging. And Netflix, as we speak, as you know, is start you know, to pay big money. Mm. Look at the Warner Brothers deal yeah. in, in the UK between Netflix and Warner Brothers. You know, Netflix is paying big bucks to actually get access to these, uh, to these uh, products. Andy Kai, a very benign outlook uh, from our gentleman, uh, both on free on, and pay. If you stay at pay for a second, and go back to the overbundled, overpriced, inflexible issue that has led to disruption in other industries. How do you see that? If you look five, 10 years out, will we still have a business model where people subscribe to package content for 100 bucks a month, or what's your perspective on this? I think, I think the US is definitely a slightly special case in that consumers are very spoiled for superb content. 
they have a lot of choice for it, but the cable packages are also really expensive and they, so long as <clears throat> someone in the family pays, I think people are comfortable. But the big question is whether this new generation, whether they will renew uh, an 80 or or $100 cable bill just to have all that content or whether they will have grown up using media very differently already and they're very happy with getting content a couple of days later maybe, but still getting content. I mean, is a TV show bad a year later if you haven't seen it? Maybe it's not. So I think the outlook is unbundling, but it's not going to happen overnight. And the, I read figures yesterday about Time Warner Cable actually dropping a couple of hundred thousand subscribers and adding broadband internet subscribers. So I think the trend is there, but it will take time. Andy? I think, con this is my personal view, is that content is never really free. Someone is paying. And uh, I kind of make a joke out of this because, you know, my, my former boss at Viacom, he said uh, content is a bit like a relationship. Someone is always paying, doesn't, it's just in different form. Sometimes you pay with money, sometimes you pay with emotions. Uh, but I think in our case, you're paying with attention. <laughs> no, I think the media business is about, it's the attention business. Yeah. So as long as someone is paying attention, there is going to be financial, uh, there's going to be terms being uh, transacted. Except if you look at what happened in uh, between 99 and 2003 in the music industry, there was lots of attention but no money. But I think we already established mm. that the music industry, right. it's a little bit different than... I want to come back to technology in a second. Because one of the very interesting theses you just, Kai, formulated was that people, if they can't get the content they want at the price they want, they would actually be willing to wait two days, three days, you know, the question I have for you, you see piracy clearly has been a big issue in other segments of the media industry. You know, we have seen it in music. I think the ebook industry is concerned of it. It hasn't been as big an issue, but probably will be more going forward. Can you talk a bit about technology and piracy and your perspective on, on that? Uh, who wants to start, Guillaume? Well, we hate piracy by definition, uh, simply because we, we are paying a lot of money to acquire our copyrights or to create our own copyrights, uh, if I take Fremantle as an example. Therefore, for us, by definition, we do everything we can to fight How it. much uh, piracy do you really see, coming back to Kai's perspective, that people actually rather wait, you know, if they can get legally their wait? Is, is that your experience? Well, obviously, as you know, it's all the numbers that you see on this are fairly fuzzy. I believe that piracy, for the time being, concerns for the most feature films. Mm. Uh, in theatrical release, as far as TV is concerned, again, since it's free, the incentive to actually pirate yeah. the programming is by far reduced because you don't need to pay seven or eight euros or ten dollars to go to the movies uh, if you can pirate it. Uh, here, it's free anyway, so why would you pirate it? Maybe to get it a little bit earlier, one or two days, <laughs> but is there real value uh, in uploading your favorite show one or two days before you know, we operate ourselves what we call premium <laughs> VOD, and when you see usage, with all due respect, it's absolutely minimal versus mm. the live free-to-air broadcast. All right, Kai? Um, so we saw something very interesting that happened, <coughs> sorry, the day that Mega Upload got closed down, at least for now, we had a 20% traffic spike. <coughs> so we, we realized that we're really competing with pirates a lot. And I think as people search for movies online and they do so by the millions and millions, <coughs> what's interesting is that Google will actually push down in their index <coughs> pirate sites that receive more than one DMCA complaint. And we think that's going to play right our way because all those people who don't find the illegal movies anymore, they will wash up somewhere. And so long as we do the right search engine optimization work, we believe a good share of those will wash up with us. And believe me, for us, it couldn't happen a day too fast or too soon. Uh, Andy, any perspective on piracy? <coughs> well, I'm absolutely against piracy. And I think in, in my business, we actually don't deal with long form content. So preview networks, we only distribute short form promotional and marketing material. So you can say that you know a core revenue uh, segment for us is we work with uh, 300 movie studios in Europe. Um, so we distribute all of their ch movie trailers and all the information, the metadata, 
to thousands of destinations. Um, so I think from our perspective, it's, you know, it's really more focused on driving the awareness and creating the demand. So you can say that uh, you know, we're, that's, how, that's, that's the stance we take against piracy by saying, you know, if we can actually increase the demand, make sure people are aware of things that are coming uh, and build up the interest. Um, that's kind of our part to the value chain. Right. Okay, if I summarize, uh, if I try to summarize at this stage, you know, we said that overbundling, overpricing, and being too inflexible could disrupt television. What we are kind of saying is, well, in terms of overbundling, not really. Uh, if you come back to what Thomas Ebeling has said, 85% of people still like the bundling, actually. It's part of the appeal. In terms of uh, overpricing, Guillaume established that actually is free. <laughs> so by definition, you're protected. And inflexibility, I think you all, Kai, uh, and, uh, Andy, and so forth, said that with catch-up TV, with different ways to get to the content in different windows, you actually address that as well. So it's a relatively benign picture. Now, I want to challenge this a little bit. Um, if you look out, what is your biggest fear? There's clearly technology developments going on right now. You know, Steve Jobs' one remaining legacy is to revolutionize the TV market. Clearly, yeah. that was his passion. They're working on the next generation TV set. Um, Google has this enormous audience that uh, on YouTube uh, they don't monetize. Uh, they might try to do that. You know, Microsoft is frustrated to the core. You know, the Xbox is the only thing that works, but they really want to break into what Apple and Google do, and maybe TV is a good, good way to do that. Amazon has a ton of cash from ha having killed the DVD market, assuming it uh, now, um, you know, going back into the streaming segment with that cash. So if you look at these four players and the technology developments they do, the content deals they're trying to strike, from all four of you, I would like to hear, you know, going away from this benign picture, what could go wrong for the current industry? You know, what are, as CEOs of these businesses, you're all doing your risk planning, I'm sure, and what are the things you're doing today to mitigate those potential risks? Maybe, Guillaume. Okay, so you push us hard here. You really want to... It's my job, you know? Our business to kind of collapse, which w will not. But I would say there are probably two things which I think we should be cognizant of and, and make sure that we understand what's going on and react against. The first one really ties in what you described about YouTube. Through YouTube and through other platforms, you've got loads of new video inventory, so to speak, made available into the market. And of course, the question is the quality of that inventory for advertisers yeah. versus TV inventory. And you could make the case that at some point, this inventory will grow more and more in value and therefore create a risk for TV inventory. So I think this is definitely an area where we need to be cognizant of, and therefore we need to make sure that TV always offers a premium versus this, what I would call, low-cost inventory. And how do you do that? That's definitely, uh, well, very simple. A, you need to have the bus shows on your platform mm -hmm. and not on the others. Right. That's, that's one. Second, it needs to be live <laughs> because there is still a huge premium linked to a live event versus a disaggregated online <laughs> infiltration, so to speak, of, of VOD through syndication or through YouTube. These are, I think, the two major tools that, uh, that we need to develop and that we, we do. And third, again, I'm always talking about hedging. We need to operate in this new segment. Just give you one example. You know, two weeks ago, we bought a, uh, an ad network in Holland called Videostrip. Why did we do that? Because we know very well how to market TV spots, but we want to make sure that we are market leaders in this new mm -hmm. online video right. advertising and that's why we need to buy into these assets as well. So we need to hedge our bets. So you don't want to wake up like Time Warner and ask yourself why you haven't built Netflix yourself or have sure bought not. it at an for early sure stage. Not. No. Thomas? Yeah, I think one, one risk for our business model is that media agencies are trying to manipulate uh, basically customers by convincing them that cheap, low quality digital advertising environments are very impactful because they make more money with these type of advertising spaces. Secondly, that um, Google becomes a gatekeeper 
especially when uh, with the use of smart TVs, um, search becomes um, critical and search is controlled by Google, they can control really to which channels the viewer is going and even more so if they own high quality content. Um, they would certainly be a very monopolistic competitor in that scenario. Those, those are my, my two risks and how to battle it. I think we have to increase our distribution, including uh, having own websites which are like YouTube and having collaborations with YouTube. Uh, as Guillaume said, I, I believe that local content and live content will be a key differentiator, especially if you want to defend yourself against global companies who have deep pockets for global content. I think local content, live content is, is very good. And we have to um, control as well our distribution and content even more. So I think the, the TV industry is well prepared for the future. Uh, there will be challenges, but even more importantly, signif significant opportunities as well. Kai? So we're clearly in a <coughs> new company, and for us, um, we see more opportunities than risks. But talking, I mean, I mentioned we're talking to a young male audience for two-thirds of, of the people we address. And the fear is always, what are we competing with? And that may be something that's completely different from TV. It could be games. It could be Facebook. Yeah, Xbox, so there, right? So there's, there's so many other things. And I'm grateful for everyone who still has the, the patience to actually watch through a movie and watch the mid-roll ads that we're placing. And what are we doing about that? I think we're taking um, a playful approach. We want to, uh, the social game we're launching, where, where you're guessing from uh, movie scenes, which movie that is leading people then into the content, could be one way of entertaining in a more snappy way than forcing people to watch through an entire movie. Um, but it's early days. I mean, for now, uh, we see ourselves more uh, wanting to get things right that are that we think we can do better than hmm. than free TV. Although in reality, as we're hearing, we're probably just complementary. Andy, ten years from now, we sit here again. You know, Marco will have grown a grey hair, and we're discussing the last ten years. What could have gone completely differently from what we discussed so far? I think my personal view is that uh, it will be interesting to see what is TV and what is uh, what we call online uh, destinations. I think the, the roles of these, uh, each of the medium might actually be very, very different. Maybe they will be reverse. Maybe TV becomes a simple kind of a preview discovery environment where everything is to drive online for long form. I'm not sure. So I think, uh, you know, five years ago, I think uh, no one could have predicted uh, the environment that we have today. YouTube is not what it used to be. And uh, so I think it's really important that uh, my biggest fear or the business challenge is the fact that, uh, let's say, content owners, uh, whether you're a channel or a programming or a production, I think it's important to know that the biggest fear for me is the content owners not recognizing uh, the importance and the strategic value of syndication to get the audience. Uh, and they simply buy into the, the robustness and the, and the huge presence of just YouTube. So right. YouTube is not the only solution, as we, we all know. So, Okay, thank you very much. The time is up. I think in summary, you see a, a group of gentlemen here who is embracing digitization, who is actually at the forefront of the industry mm -hmm. changes, and which is clearly very interesting and different from what we saw 10 years ago in the music industry. So thank you very much. A big hand of, a round of applause for these four gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.